We are continuing our exploration of the kingdom of God as revealed in Jesus' ministry, and specifically um, as it's revealed in his parables, and the stories that he told. So today, today we're going to be looking at uh, a parable from Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 33. You can find this on page 691 of your pew Bibles, or you can follow along on the screen. So let's listen to God's word together, beginning in verse 31 of Matthew chapter 13. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the day. He's praying for you. God, we thank you for the way that your son Jesus had of opening our eyes and opening our ears to the realities of a kingdom much bigger than us kingdom much bigger than this world, a kingdom in which your will and your purposes are accomplished in our lives and through our lives, throughout your creation. God, we pray that as we reflect on these words that your son spoke, that you might give us eyes to see you and ears to hear you, that you might give us hearts and minds that are open to this amazing and magnificent work that you are doing, and that you might help us to grow in you in our love for you, in our knowledge of you, and in our understanding of you. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Amen. One of our most uh, abundant and enduring literary types is the figure of the underdog. Whether it's because of our revolutionary past or maybe because of some far more ancient memory, we all love a scrappy hero who overcomes all odds to achieve some lasting glory. And we all have our favorite underdogs. Rocky Balboa, the Philadelphia heavyweight who rises from obscurity to become champion of the world. Rudy Rudiger, the five foot nothing, 100 pound nothing kid from Joliet, Illinois who dons the blue and gold of Notre Dame. Seabiscuit, the pint sized thoroughbred who somehow bests war admiral in the race of the century. Mr. Smith, Jefferson Smith, the small town senator in the Jimmy Stewart movie who goes to Washington and upsets the political machine. The point is that we all enjoy a good underdog story, but the funny thing about our fascination with underdogs is that it's largely a game of hindsight. See, before the battle, before the contest, the, the majority of us would not be likely to back the dark horse. That's what makes an underdog an underdog. We might watch the movie Hoosiers and cheer when Hickory High beats South Bend in the state championship, but before the tip-off, had we been there, I think that most of us would have been more likely to side with the masses to acknowledge that the little guys didn't have much of a chance. We might rejoice when David beats Goliath, but had we been there on that day, even as David was gathering his stones from the brook, we probably would have put our money on the giant. What's more, rooting for the underdog is kind of a vicarious pleasure. It's something we enjoy seeing in other people's lives, right? We might, we might stand at a distance and clap when the underdog succeeds. We might marvel from afar and nod our head approvingly when the little guy accomplishes surprising and amazing feats. But it takes a special sort of person to be the underdog and to do what it takes to succeed. We might all cheer for Rudy when he's taking the field for Notre Dame, but no one wants to be Rudy when he's slaving away in a steel mill and listening to the laughter of everyone who tells him he'll never play football. We might all scream for Rocky when he's knocking out Apollo Creed, but no one wants to be Rocky when everyone is telling him what a bum he is. We might all rise to our feet for Daniel LaRusso, the karate kid, when he's doing his flying crane takedown of Johnny in the All-Valley Karate Championship. But no one wants to be Daniel LaRusso when he's getting picked on by the bullies at his high school. See, it takes someone with a truly prophetic vision 
to see the virtues of being an underdog at the beginning of the story. It takes someone with a, a truly courageous faith to embrace the status of underdog when the ending of the story, the fairy tale ending of the story, is still a few pages or maybe even a few chapters away. And that brings us to our passage for today. Because at the heart of what Brennan Manning calls the ragamuffin gospel are these parables of the kingdom that are also underdog stories. These brief parables that I read today are tales of the unlikely and unforeseen ways that God achieves victory. The unlikely and unforeseen ways that God accomplishes his purposes in this world. When Jesus stood in a fishing boat 2,000 years ago, and when he spoke to a crowd gathered on the shore, when he used stories to construct a vision of the kingdom for anyone who had eyes to see and ears to hear, he was directing his message at a group of people who, unwillingly or reluctantly perhaps, could be described as the ultimate underdogs. See, when Jesus came into the world, he came as a Jew. He was living in Roman-occupied Palestine. He was one of a despised people group who lived under the thumb of the biggest bully on the block. And what's more, their subjugation to Rome was only the most recent chapter in a long history of being picked <coughs> on and pushed around. First there was Egypt, then the Philistines, then Assyria, then Babylon, then Persia, then Greece. See, there was always somebody bigger and stronger and more ruthless than the children of Abraham. So they could be forgiven for having a bit of an underdog complex. And Jesus' parables here speak to that. But if we push this a little further, we find that Jesus' specific audience, even more than his general one, was a ragtag collective that was woefully overmatched and under-equipped for the task at hand. The task of embracing and embodying a kingdom that would endure for all eternity. This group of fishermen and zealots, tax collectors and prostitutes, afflicted and affected outcasts who congregated around this carpenter's son, they were despised even by their own people. They were the underdogs' underdogs. They didn't even show up on Rome's radar because they were too busy getting bullied and shamed by their own religious leaders and cultural elites. See, Jesus' earliest followers weren't even good enough to sit at table with their fellow Jews. So how could anyone reasonably expect that they could accomplish much of anything worth writing home about? Well, the answer is simple. No one could reasonably expect that at all. No one reasonably expected that that congregation on the lakeshore listening to Jesus would ever be much of anything, would ever amount to much of anything, other than the, the perennial whipping boys for the empire, the perennial butts of a few jokes. But that's just it. See, God's purposes operate and unfold outside of the realm of reasonable expectation. Even if no one expected it, Jesus, the Son of God, who had called these people to follow him, didn't just expect that these people would do great things. He knew it. He knew that the kingdom of his father, he knew that the kingdom that he had come to earth to establish was at his very heart an unexpected and unforeseen sort of kingdom. Full of unexpected and unforeseen and unlikely mercies and wonders. And he knew that these people who had been picked on and ignored for most of their lives would be at the heart of that. So he told some stories. Like last week's parables in which Jesus described his followers as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The statements Jesus makes here focus on a couple of common elements. Some ordinary objects. But Jesus uses these commonplace items to spin a vision of God's glorious movement. The items Jesus uses here are a seed, a mustard seed, and a pinch of yeast. But in the imagination of our Savior, these two little crumbs of reality become so much more. And there are Three qualities of these objects that I want to focus on today. Three qualities of these objects that serve to drive home what Jesus was saying about his kingdom. What Jesus was saying about people who were citizens of that kingdom and instruments of that kingdom. And the first and maybe most obvious is the smallness of these objects. In the parable, Jesus describes the mustard seed as the smallest of all your seeds. And when he said this, he was alluding to kind of the proverbial wisdom among Palestinian farmers of his day. If there was one thing that every farmer and every gardener knew about a mustard seed, it's that it was tiny. So it was an odd point of reference for a kingdom, especially the kingdom of Yahweh. I can imagine the, the disciples and the rest of Jesus' audience, as they so often did when they were listening to Jesus, hearing his opening, the kingdom of heaven is light. And I can see visions of conquering armies and death from above rain down on their enemies starting to, to enter their minds. 
And then Jesus continued, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Wait, what? A mustard seed? See, even for a group of people who were used to thinking of themselves as underdogs, this was probably a bridge too far. But Jesus explains. He says, even though the mustard seed is small, even though it's tiny, it grows. It becomes something much bigger. It becomes a, a shrub or a, or a tree, 8 to 10 feet tall. So big that birds from all over can come and nest in it. And then Jesus continues. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast, another small minuscule item, hardly noticeable, pinched between two fingers and sprinkled into a recipe. And Jesus kind of hammers on this image when he says that the yeast is mixed through a large amount of flour. I like to imagine that he sort of emphasized that word, a large amount of flour. The Greek translation here literally says three sadas of flour, which amounts to somewhere between 20 and 40 liters. What impact could such a small ingredient make when, when compared to such a large amount of dough? What impact could such a small group of people make when compared with such a, a big and, and scary and overwhelming culture? Well, anyone who has tasted the difference between unleavened bread and a batch of yeast rolls knows the, the impact that yeast can make. Knows that something as tiny as yeast can make an enormous amount of significance. So it is with God's kingdom. The second quality of these two objects, the, the mustard seed and the yeast that Jesus draws on in the story, is something that may not be as obvious or as, as immediately obvious as the first. And this is their uncleanness or their impurity that's built into these images. See, last week when we talked about the salt of the earth and the light of the world, I mentioned how these two elements, salt and light, enjoyed a kind of double life among the Jews. They, they were not only common household objects, common things that we would see every day, they were also sacred. They also had a religious significance. They were holy in some way. But with the mustard seed and the yeast, we get the opposite perspective. Each of these items came with a certain amount of baggage, some dubious associations in the minds of Jesus and his hearers. See, the mustard seed, according to Jewish law, would be something of an unwelcome visitor in any garden plot. According to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, there was a principle known as the law of diverse kinds. And this law pertained to mixing things that weren't supposed to be mixed. Most famously, it was applied to, to cooking meat and dairy uh, together. It was, it was applied to, to wearing clothing made of two different kinds of fabric. It was applied to Jews marrying Gentiles. But it was also applied to the kinds of seeds that should and should not be planted. According to the, the Mishnah Kalayim, which was a, an early document of rabbinic Judaism, a mustard seed was one kind of seed, and a vegetable seed was another. Therefore, you would not put the two in the same plot of ground. You would not plant a mustard seed in your garden. It would be unclean to do so. It would be against the, the regulations of the law to do so. And like many of the injunctions found in the law, this was because there was a, a practical element to this command. See, mustard seed was kind of a nuisance. Jesus calls it a tree here, or maybe a shrub. I think he's being kind. Maybe he's being sarcastic. I like to think of him smirking as he says it, because in the minds of most people in his audience that day, the, the mustard bush he was talking about wasn't just a tree, it wasn't just a shrub, it was like a mutant Godzilla plant. Think like kudzu or crabgrass. Once it was sown, you were not getting rid of it. It would grow and it would spread and eventually it would take over your garden or your field completely. And so if the phrase kingdom of heaven is a pleasant and serene image in your mind, if the kingdom of God is something that you would like to compartmentalize. If it's something that you're, you're inclined to push to the side, if you'd like to kind of push God's purposes into a neat and tidy corner of your life and keep the rest for yourself, Jesus' parable here should disavow you of that notion. Because if you let so much as a mustard seed-sized chunk of God's work into your life, be prepared for the disorderly havoc that can ensue as God and, and the, the Spirit of God and the movement of God begins to turn your life upside down and to call into question a lot of things that you thought you had figured out. Now, yeast has some of the same associations, of course. From Passover onward, yeast is seen as something unclean. It's a foreign element that brings corruption into something pure. Whether we're talking about literal yeast added to unleavened bread, 
or whether we're talking about the yeast of false teaching that could spread the, through the community of God's people. This is hardly a fitting image for the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus knew what he was doing. I think that, that Jesus knew that, that even at this early stage in his ministry, there were already whispers, there were already suspicions about this community he was establishing. There were already whispers and suspicions about the methods that, that Jesus was using. His ways of, of demonstrating the powerful love and undeniable truth of God. Jesus ate meat and drank wine with sinners. Well, he must be a glutton and a drunkard, they said. Jesus healed people on the Sabbath. He should be ashamed of himself. His disciples didn't ritualistically wash before supper. Was there no decency? The rules of propriety simply were not being followed. This group of unclean, unlettered tradespeople couldn't be subjects of the kingdom. This homeless carpenter's son certainly couldn't be the king. Again, I like to imagine Jesus sort of winking at the crowds when he compares the kingdom of heaven, the very realm in which God's will and God's purposes are accomplished with yeast, the sign of all that was unclean and defiled. Is this where God chooses to work? Does God really choose to work in the lives of sinners rather than in the lives of the righteous? Is this who God chooses to employ? Fishermen rather than Pharisees? Well, that's the kingdom Jesus talked about. That's the kingdom he came to bring. And finally, these objects are significant because they both contain some element of mystery. We can see point A. We see a, a tiny seed. We see a pinch of yeast. We see point B. We see a, a tree full of birds, a big batch of dough. But what we don't always see is what comes in between. How do we get from here to there? So we might, we might scientifically understand quite a lot about what one poet has called the force that through the green fuse drives the flower. But that doesn't make the development of life from a tiny seed any less miraculous. We might have quite a lot of knowledge about the chemical processes that are involved in the rising of bread, but the procedure still takes place in silence. It still takes place in darkness, usually when we're not looking. See, the ways in which God achieves his purposes are his ways. And there's always going to be some aspect of beautiful and miraculous mystery in the way that God brings his kingdom to bear on this world. Gerhard Lofig says, The reign of God is not like the mustard seed or the developed bush, but the whole process from seed to shrub. We might be a part of that process. Hopefully we submit ourselves to this process. We might enjoy the ride as God moves us along on his course of action, but we will never be in charge of the process. We can never manipulate the process. See, a, a good farmer, a good gardener, respects the whole context of growth. Land, seed, rain, sun. Because he or she knows that, that they're dealing with forces beyond them. A good baker respects the ingredients at hand because there's a wonderful sort of magic at work in the ways that these things come together. And in the same way, we respect and we rejoice at the unexpected, unforeseen ways that God is working among us and in us and through us as he brings his purposes to fruition. We have the luxury of, of opening the gospel after 2,000 years of Christian history. I would say that we're probably much closer to the end of this underdog story than the beginning. If that group on the seashore 2,000 years ago struggled a little bit with wondering how this was all going to turn out, where their gospel adventure was going to lead. It's important to keep in mind that they didn't have the benefit of hindsight. What they had were the stories that Jesus told. They had to make some decisions about whether they were going to believe these stories, whether they were going to submit to his kingdom work with everything they had. And we have to make some of the same decisions, day in and day out, as, as we seek to be a part of this kingdom that Jesus established. As we wrestle with the, the context in which he has placed us, with the people he brings into our lives. And we feel very, at times, overwhelmed and under-equipped. And just because we're, we're closer to the end of the story than the beginning, that doesn't mean we, we don't still struggle with all sorts of questions about how God could possibly be using us. About how God could possibly be working out his purposes through ordinary people like us. Because we look in the mirror and we see Rocky Balboa, not when he's standing over his opponent, Hearing the, the knockout count. Now we look in the mirror and we see Rocky Balboa when he's struggling to make ends meet. We look in the mirror and we see David 
Not when he's just brought Goliath down, but when he's staring at the imposing figure of his giant enemy. We look in the mirror and we see a mustard seed. We see a pinch of yeast. Not the finished product, but just a, a small, imperfect little chunk of God's creation. And so we need to be reminded that, that God's kingdom is a miraculous business. We need to be reminded that, that God's mission is and always has been fulfilled through some pretty unlikely heroes. We need to be reminded that God's ways are mysterious and subversive and completely unforeseen. And once we're reminded of these things, we need to live in faith. That if we will submit to God's work, if we will give ourselves over to what He's doing, then He will continue to, to write this underdog story until it reaches the conclusion that He has planned. Please pray. God, we thank You that in so many ways You reveal Your power. And You never reveal Your power more than when You reveal it in our weakness. God, when we come to You, maybe hurting Maybe humbled, maybe wondering how we're going to make it through the day. And we come to you with all kinds of questions about how you could possibly be doing anything good in our lives through us. How you could possibly be having an impact on our world and our culture through us. God, we thank you that when we come to you with open hearts, with open lives, with a willingness to be used by you, that you, you answer our questions. Maybe not in the ways we'd expect, certainly not in any ways we could predict, but in ways that point to, to your goodness, your grace, your power. God, all we have to bring are our lives, which may look like mustard seeds when other people look at them. But Lord, when you look at our lives, you see something great. Because you see what you can do with the life that is given over to you. You see the salvation and the hope and the, the life that you can bring. So God, help us to be faithful in this. Just as we know that you are always faithful to do what you have promised. It's in your son's name we pray these things.